There's several ways of counting the atoms, one of which was the amount of nuclei that you get in the early universe that I told you about. Another one is we think we know the speed of sound, and the speed of sound of hydrogen was something we can measure in the early universe, and that gives you a measurement from the microwave background of how many atoms there were, and it agrees with what nuclei told you. And so there's a consistency to the whole picture, and it really speaks to there being something out there, and it seems not to be what modified gravity would give you. There's two things out there. It can't all be dark matter because dark matter would not make the universe accelerate. That's a very bizarre thing for gravity to do. And dark matter doesn't do that because, by assumption, it was inferred in galaxies and clusters of galaxies because it gravitates in an ordinary way. So, I'm out of time basically. So, the cosmos, the what is dark energy story, I'll put off till Thursday. But the, the short version of it is that the, there's a problem. And the problem is, uh, at face value, there's not a problem. But then there is a problem when you look at it more carefully. And I'll just leave you with that thought of what the problems are. So the, fa the face value part of it is that uh, the thing that, that, that people assumed when they made those plots, when they asked what the dark energy was, was that they assumed it was what's called the cosmological constant. And so if you take Einstein's equations, the cosmological constant is this, this is a story you've probably heard, but uh, Einstein modified his equations shortly after he wrote them down. Because when he wrote them down, he found that uh, when he thought about cosmology, that he found the first thing he found was that uh, the universe could not be static. It had to expand or contract, more or less because of the usual argument. If you try to sit things, when they're all attracting under gravity, then they all fall together. You can't arrange things to just sit there if everybody's feeling an attractive force. So he modified the equations by adding this cosmological term. And uh, that was nice because the cosmological term effectively add, behaved as if it was a repulsive force. And that allowed gravity to balance something and have a static universe. Then almost immediately, they discovered the universe was expanding. And so he realized that that was actually stupid, that uh, you know, he could have been famous. He could have predicted the universe was expanding, but he didn't. He said he was a conservative. He said that the universe should be static. He changed his laws. And the evidence came in that the universe was expanding. And so he immediately decided that you've got to drop that term. But that term, because it was designed to repel under gravity, is exactly what the dark energy likes to be. It's a uh, if you thought of if you thought of taking this thing and putting it on the other side of the equations and interpret it as being a piece of energy, then it has specific kinds of properties. The energy would have been this. If you the energy this 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 energy density is telling you both the energy density and the pressure of the, whatever the source is uh, of gravity. And if you ask what, what would those things have been if this has been what the source energy was, it turns out they'd both be constants. The energy density and the pressure would be a constant. And that's exactly the kind of thing that because it's the uh, pressure, because the, the pressure in particular is negative, that's the kind of thing that gives you a repulsive force. And besides making the universe static, it, uh, it could be possible to make the universe static. It also can account for the acceleration of the universe's expansion. Uh, and this is what people use when they make those plots as to how much dark energy uh, is there. So people debate about, you know, so what, what was the stupidest thing Einstein ever did? Was it, was it stupid to put the thing in the first place? Or was it stupid to take it out again once he put it in? Because he could have also predicted dark energy was there. So he missed two boats. <laughs> <laughs> but the real thing is, is, the modern point of view is that uh, actually that's not the point. The point was that the, the stupid part was to think he got to choose. But really, you don't have an option as to thinking of this as being a, a piece of energy and, and, and acknowledging that it looks like what the vacuum energy should have been. Uh, the way to think about the, the, the cosmological constant is, is you're really asking a physical question. Does the vacuum have any energy? Normally, you can't measure the vacuum energy, but gravity can measure it. And so the physical question is, does the vacuum have any energy? If it does, it'll gravitate, and it'll look like a cosmological constant. And at face value, that's the simplest way to think of the dark, the dark energy. It's just the vacuum energy, and you're done. That nails all the observations. It gets all the things right that, uh, that they measure about uh, the dark energy and cosmology. So, they, so why are people unhappy? The, pe the reason people are, are unhappy is that we think we can calculate the vacuum energy. And it should be enormous. It should be much, much bigger than it's been measured to be. It should be the electron alone contributes to the vacuum energy 10 to the 30 times larger than it has been measured. And every particle that we know about should be contributing more than that, uh, with a few exceptions. So the cosmological constant problem is that uh, although the vacuum energy does a great job of describing what's there, we think that it should be huge. And I'm going to skip the next few slides because I'm out of time. 
Well, let me cut to the, uh, to the story here. Is, this is really just a, sh a story about why the vacuum energy should be small. And then I'm going to skip to the part that says why it is small. And come back on Thursday if you want to see that. So what's the bottom line? Let me close off here. So the, the, the bottom line is that it really is true that cosmologists are having a great time. And they're testing this hot Big Bang model. And it's working really, really well. And the reason it all smells nice is that there's more than one way. They're testing it many more ways than they have parameters. So the fact that the, that the model works at all is it has got a lot of consistency tests in it. That the, there's, there's the, it needn't have been true that all the different ways you had of inferring the, the, the properties of what's out there gave you the same answer. But they do. There's many ways of getting a handle on what's out there. And they all give you the same picture. And that's why they call it this concordance cosmology. It's a concordance of many lines of evidence, all pointing towards this very simple picture as to why the universe is expanding. The only thing that's weird about it is that there's these two things out there that you don't know what they are. But they do make the universe expand the way it seems to be observed to do. You have to have this dark matter and dark energy. You get to debate about what they are. For people like you, this is a huge opportunity. You know, this is something which is just just starting to be uh, be. This is the problem of our time, which will probably be solved in your time because you're kind of in the right time frame for it. And so it's really the mother of all problems. Is 95% of what's out there is completely unknown, and uh, it's a question of identifying theoretically and experimentally what it is to really pin down its properties. But whatever it is, it's not what you read about in or what you learn about in physics classes. So your professors are lying to you at some level. It's all, the, the matter has the properties that they say it does have, but that's really telling you not a whole bunch about what's in the universe, because it's only at most 5% of what's out there. Dark matter, I would say, is more likely some kind of a new particle. It's, uh, that gets all of the evidence right, gets them all right at once. It's easy to do, it, it's, it, it's easy to accommodate with what we know about, the, about other kinds of physics. But dark energy, very likely it's the vacuum energy that's describing dark energy. But the party line, if you ask people in the business except for me, is that uh, the vacuum energy has a puzzle in it because we think the vacuum should have a lot of energy. It should have a lot of quantum zero point energy. And for some reason, that energy is not gravitating. And it's a mystery to most people why that's true. I think I know the answer. The problem with, with me just knowing the answer, there's a, Andy uh, Elbrecht is a cosmologist, and he has a a pithy way of saying what's wrong with people who believe that dark energy they've solved, and that none of the none of the theories pass the ego test. If you meet someone like me who thinks that they know what's going on and they're enthusiastic about a theory, you if you ask them, is that your theory? They always say yes. Whereas that's not true for dark matter. There's many people who believe in dark matter, different kinds of dark matter particles, and they didn't all invent that theory. It's been a good enough theory that that it's been able to persuade other people to, to think about it and work on it. And so far, dark energy has not been like that. There's no theory which has been sufficiently attractive in it that people have, uh, can, have uh, accumulated around it. But that's where we stand. Thank you for your time. Question? Comment? I hope I didn't speak too fast. <laughs> You say you don't believe in um, uh, multiply gravity because uh, uh, you'll be hard to be consistent with uh, some from the fundamental properties. Would you elaborate to what those are? Yeah, yeah. So, so the the question is is uh, this is independent of how well they do with describing the, the observations of dark matter? It's just just what are the what are the, the the issues of principle that make it hard to modify gravity? And on long distances. So the story there is is the is the story of it's a is um, it's all it's all to do with the, in the end of the day the, there's a, the consistency issue of uh, quantum mechanics and relativity comes down to causality that, that basically you're all happy with the the the, the in special relativity that we have the, the you know the property of relativity of simultaneity right that if you that if we think that something is happening at the same time someone who's moving through this room at different speeds would say that this is faster than this one, or this is faster than this one. And so there's a basic disagreement as to the ordering of events in time. And, and so you might have thought, well, that's a problem if you're trying to predict the future from the past, which is what science does. And of course, Einstein finesses that. And he gets away with it because 
He says that the only things that you can disagree about the ordering in time are the ones for which signals can't get from here to here without going faster than the speed of light. And so because you can't go faster than the speed of light, it never matters what the ordering of these things in time are. If we have something where light can get from here to here, everybody will agree on the ordering of the, those things in time because that's part of the story of causality, that, that the influence of this will have to influence. This will influence this and not the other way around. But in quantum mechanics, what happens is that if you're really sure where things are, you're not completely sure about what their energies are or what their momenta are because of the uncertainty principle. And so there's some room for there to be uncertainty. So you can have things which, you, which are kind of on the edge of light traveling from one to the other. And if you really think you accurately know that you're right on the edge of the light cone, the, the places where your light can travel from one to the other, in quantum mechanics, you're going to have some uncertainty that you could be actually in the re region where they could have been causally in contact. So in quantum mechanics, you really have to go back and rethink the issue. How do you predict the future from the past? Because it really will be true that there will be events that people can disagree on the ordering in time where signals are going from one to the other, quantum mechanically. There's a non-zero amplitude for, for A to influence B, even though uh, the signal would have to go faster than light. It has an amplitude doing that because quantum mechanics uh, allows it to because of the uncertainty principle. And so the, the way that that plays out in quantum field theory is that, that you get away with it, but you get away with it because there's a story that's, that everybody can tell. If you, th if you think that this is first and this is second, and you think that a particle went here to here, and I think that that's actually not true, this is first and this is second, I have to have a story that can describe the same physics where a particle goes from here to here. And that's what antiparticles are. So if I think that if you thought that an electron carried plus one unit of charge from here to here, I have to have a particle that could have gone from here to here and carry minus one unit of charge. I guess I've got the signs wrong. If the electron carried minus one unit of charge from here to here, then a positron would carry plus one unit of charge from there to there. But they have to have exactly the same mass so that the energy is, is the same that we'd see. They have to have the same interactions so that we get the same story for what happened in the future from the past. And so that, that the very delicate uh, arrangement that, that uh, any particles allow you to get away with the exist, uh, this, this, this causality problem that was there in, in, in quantum mechanics and relativity. And those two things together in quantum field theory tell you that uh, if you have a massless spin one particle coupling to anything, uh, the only way it can, it can consistently couple to, to matter is uh, if there is, if it's electromagnetism basically. That it's, you, know, gave, you can derive the principles of, of electromagnetism from quantum mechanics, basically from unitarity and, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the motherhood principles of quantum mechanics. And so that gives us a very deep understanding as to why Maxwell's equations are true. That, that massless particles will have to, uh, the consistency of quantum mechanics and relativity will have to be described by Maxwell's equations. And the same story for gravity is that, that it leads you to general relativity. So there's a, so on long distances, it's very difficult to modify the properties of gravity without, the, the only known, the only modifications that we know are not inconsistent are uh, general relativity coupled to some things like photons or some, uh, Maybe, maybe spinless particles or some small list of fields. And so, and that's basically the problem. When you start uh, doing things that are stranger, you tend to get into this causality problem again because this very delicate balance is not working. On smaller distances, you can do it. So, so it's easy to modify things in small distances and almost everything will. And we're expecting that uh, very much, but on long distances, it's very hard to do. And in cosmology, you're on the longest distances possible. So the, so the game that people play is they say, well, on, on infinite distances, that's everything I told you is true. But if you come in at the Hubble scale, at very long but finite distances, something will happen. And then the, the game will be to try and modify cosmology and not screw up the solar system, say. And that's, a, and that's no one's been able to do that successfully. And it's not, not like there's a no-go theorem. But, it's, it's, but it, the, the fact that it's hard is because of this, this basic consistency issue with quantum mechanics and relativity. New particles, does that imply the, uh, you know, the new, uh, new fundamental interaction? It could, yeah, in, the, in a sense. And does that kind of, how can I put this, does that give rise some uh, support to the mold, or is it even, that is it like a mold by gravity, that kind of thing? So no, there, there I, would, I would say no. So, so the, but this is again my opinion. So, so, so there's just, but there's two separate issues there. I think Samand is, is uh, I told you there was a theory that does a really good job of nailing how gravity, how galaxies would work, how to modify gravity to make uh, galaxies behave the way they seem to behave without needing dark matter. That's the mod. Uh, but that, independent of whether or not uh, there's a new particle, um, I would say that mod. The problem with mod is that it's uh, it's it doesn't it doesn't explain the other lines of evidence. It doesn't get clusters of galaxies right. 
it makes the assumption that gravity changes if your acceleration is sufficiently small. And in clusters of galaxies, it's smaller than it is in galaxies. So there's no understanding of how that works. But the new particles, I think, the new particles, uh, that, that could very well mean new interactions. It, it doesn't, it depends. For a particle physicist, a new interaction is just really another new particle. So if, if the new particle is a boson, it would like to accumulate in the, in the fields because it's a boson and it likes to stay together. And that's what we would call an interaction. So for a particle physicists, any new boson is a, is, a, is a new interaction. But there's nothing that says that the particle we're talking about for dark matter has to be a boson. It might be a fermion. So if you mean by interactions of force, there needn't be a new force. It depends on a new particle with respect to dark matter. You have emphasized your your answer to your dark energy candidate to be uh, on Thursday. But um, can you do some uh, advertisement here? <laughs> Thank you for that question. I don't know this man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, let me. I'll just do a very short thing because I know that people have places to go. Maybe. So, so let me let me so, so let me say what I think the problem is, and then why there's a loophole in which you can find a solution. And I'm not, I won't give the details of the solution, but you'll see where I'm going. So the way I think you should think about the cosmological constant problem is that there's two things which we think should be different, which Einstein tells us should be the same. So what are those two things? So the two things are, on the one hand, we think the vacuum energy is actually there, and it's probably very large. And so that's what I'm calling here express energy in vacuum. It's got some number, and it's some number which is probably large. But when cosmologists tell you they've measured the dark energy, they're not actually measuring the energy. What they're measuring is the, something like the acceleration of the universe's expansion. They're telling you what the curvature is. And so they're measuring the curvature of the universe, and they're finding that it's not very large. It's there, but it's not very large. And the problem is that Einstein tells us it's the same thing. Because it, Einstein tells us that curvature is equal to energy density with some proportionality factor which is known. And so, and in particular, because the vacuum is such a simple thing, it's a Lorentz invariant thing, it's translation invariant, if, if you had a complicated source of energy, you could imagine that, that maybe if, it's, if all the matter's here, the gravitational field might be big here, but it might be small, far away from, the, from where the energy is. But the vacuum is everywhere. And because it's a, the vacuum's everywhere, it's a direct obstruction to having small curvature. If you have something this simple for the energy and you put it into, into, into this equation, you cannot have small curvature, and that's the problem. So you're trying to break that link, that, that the large energies that are Lorentz invariant have to imply curvatures that are the ones that, uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are large in cosmology. And so the thought is that this argument that I'm giving you, that, that the conundrum is specifically a conundrum if we only have four dimensions. Because the vacuum is simple in the dimensions that we see, but if there are more than four dimensions, it doesn't have to be simple in those other dimensions. And if the, if the energy has to curve something, it doesn't have to curve the dimensions that the cosmologists are measuring. It has to curve something, but maybe it's curving the extra dimension. And so the, the, the simplest example that something like this could work is if you, if you were doing taking general relativity as a course, you know, in electromagnetism, the first thing they do is they give you the point particle, and then they give you the line charge. And they ask you, what's the electromagnetic field for a line charge? So if you did the same thing for gravity, and you ask, what's the gravitational field of a line distribution of mass, then you see something interesting. So if you have a line distribution of mass, here's a line distribution of mass. Uh, and you ask what its gravitational field is, it turns out it's flat. So there's no curvature for a line distribution of mass. And so this is supposed to be a picture of the solution. This is a slab of space time. And what happens when you have a line distribution of mass is that uh, you're supposed to cut a wedge out of the space time and glue it together. And so what happens is that the space time transverse to the line distribution of mass is like a cone. It's got, it's got a missing angle in it. And so it has a kind of a pointy bit. And that pointy bit is right where the mass distribution is. But everything else is flat. So if you tried to measure the, the um, tidal effects, tidal forces, you'd find them to be zero everywhere because things are flat. But if you if you pass two light rays past this line, here's the, in the line mass, you took two light rays, one on this side and one on the other side. When I glue these two things together, this one will come in from the, from the you know, perpendicular again. And so you see that two light rays will converge after they've gone around the, the line mass. And that's how you see that light, light rays are being bent by gravity. And so the solution here is known. But if you would now imagine that you're a little two-dimensional cosmologist who's living with one space and one time direction, the energy density of this line distribution of mass is relativistic in the same way that the vacuum energy would have been. 
And you would have said, I've got a big vacuum energy. This is this energy density of the string. What's the curvature that my cosmologists on the string measure on the string? It turns out to be zero. And it's zero because this big energy density on, the, on, this, on this string is actually curving the directions transverse to the string to give you this conical singularity. It's not curving the geometry on the string. And so that shows you that, there's a, that you can break the link between energy density and uh, curvature in a way that might be fruitful in cosmology. And so, so the idea is to do this with two more dimensions where we're living on a string like this and gravity is, being cur is curving the extra dimensions, but not what you see in cosmology. And the existence of this solution is not sufficient to solve the cosmological problem. You probably have to work harder than that, but we have been working harder, and I think, I think it works, actually. So I think that's the picture we should be looking for. And the energy that you see in the vacuum energy is the Casimir energy associated with the quantum fluctuations in this extra dimension. So you heard it from me. If it's wrong, you'll, uh, I'll never remind you I gave this talk, but if it's right, I'm going to go back and tell every one of you I gave this talk in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going on. Pretty much in line with my proposal. <laughs> there's a, lot, there's a, lot, a lot, lot in this. Any other questions, comments? Well, if you're not, let's say clip again. Let's <laughs> clip and Brian will be around again.